<laughs> nice to see you all here. Wow, this is a this is a first. We actually had to carry in new, uh, more chairs. We ran out of chairs because so many people turned up. So give yourself a big round of applause. Thank you. So welcome to um, Handy Business School's new Cape Town campus. Uh, we we newly opened and uh, and ready for business, open for business, and hoping and hoping to see you all a lot more. Um, super happy that we have this uh, this amazing event tonight, and I have to say thanks to to, to Monday and Kuru from the BMF, who have been such amazing partners in putting this uh, in putting this together tonight, and we're going to see this as a start of an ongoing series of, of uh, collaborative events. So I'm very excited about that, both in Johannesburg and in Cape Town. Um, a little bit of context, if you don't know the school, Hindi Business School is a truly international business school. Uh, it's got a strong UK signature, but it's a global entity. We have campuses all over the world, and we have a big thriving campus in Johannesburg. Um, uh, it's the first business school to be quadruple accredited in South Africa. And uh, the, the Hindi MBA, the executive MBA, has been ranked as the top MBA in South Africa, and Hindi are the top players in executive education by the rankings in South Africa as well. So it's, uh, the, the, the business in, Cape Town, in Johannesburg is growing. It's, it's seen really significant growth uh, under the leadership of our Dean, John Foster Pedley, who I'm going to introduce to you in a second. Um, and um, what we want to do in Cape Town is have the same impact that we've had in Gauteng. And that's to uh, close the learning gap, create brilliant leaders, and if I can quote uh, the Henley Africa purpose statement, we build the people that build the businesses that build Africa. So that's the intention of the school, and we're hoping to get the same sort of activity here in, in the Western Cape as we've had in Gauteng. So uh, if anybody wants any more detail or any info, please tap me or my colleague Iman's shoulder and we'll be happy to have a chat to you before you leave the evening if you want any kind of details. Iman's over there. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, without any further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce you to our Africa Dean, uh, John Foster Pedley, who's currently in South, in, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, uh, and he's going to join us via Zoom to give you a real warm Handy Africa welcome. So, John, if you're there, over to you. Thank you. Thank ah. you so much, Barry. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. I remember watching you playing drums with a Johnny Clegg for so many gigs. And look at you now. Running, actually running a business. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all here, um, both online and in Cape Town. And I hope we're going to do this in Joburg as well. So, Monday, thank you very much. Monday Lobo, uh, Managing Director of BMF, a uh, handy alumnus and a good friend. Thank you very much for doing this. Professor, Professor Julie Madensella, what an absolute honor it is to have you here. And I hope we can lure you to uh, out of the Cape up to Joburg one time as well. I'm looking forward to hearing Patrick Kulati. Thank you very much. And Good Governors Africa. I mean, I'll stand up from uh, Westgrove. And, and all the people who are here. I looked at the audience earlier. I saw, I saw so many people that, uh, that I know. So it's just wonderful you've turned up. I've got to a few words to say. We've been through an election. Um, and it, we're waiting on tender hooks to see what's going to happen next. Whatever happens next, we're going to have to manage it. And as a business school with the same statement you can see behind me, we build a people who build a businesses to build Africa. We are really dedicated to giving the sort of ethical leadership, uh, the skills, or the capabilities, the confidence, especially the confidence to actually build our businesses. I do think we tend to look outside and wonder if we are as good as that lot in the States, whatever. I can tell you from our results on our MBA, which is done blind tested with loads of British executives, Germans, Scandinavians, and Asian, but the South Africans do as well, if not better, than all of those in blind assessments on our MBAs. So we've got all the talent we want in South Africa, and I really hope that we're going to be able to continue uh, to develop that with people in South Africa, and also that we'll be able to build 
more and more of this sort of really compelling thought leadership and the world voices, experienced voices we're going to hear now. And I hope we're going to have a great session. I so wish I could be there with you. You haven't come here to listen to me, so I'm going to bow out very quickly. With my thanks, I'm going to hand over to um, Monday Lovell. So Monday, over to you. Thank you very much for listening, folks. Uh, this one and this one. Okay, I think this one's got more, more life right now. Um, so, Monday, welcome. Uh, Monday is a Rohingya uh, MBA alumnus and the head of our amazing Johannesburg chapter. Just um, as, a, as, a, as an aside, and also, of course, the Rohingya network of the BMF. So, Monday, welcome to, welcome to your campus. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Barry. Oh, this is too good. It's all right. Thank you very much, Barry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe. Oh, it could be better than that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great pleasure and privilege to be here with you and all the guests. Um, Observed as well as doing the BMF. So first, I would like to welcome the acting president of the BMF, Mary uh, Limuadu, who's amongst us, and uh, shortly she will give a BMF message. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, Western Cape uh, chairperson, Sis um, and the NM is also with us here as well. And the summit leadership of the BMF in the Western Cape, and also the Henry alumni team, Mamodese. Um, uh, Barry, etc., that we work with as well at uh, any business school, and uh, and also um, from the head office at uh, BMF, welcome. Um, Kumu as well, who's been uh, a great assistance in terms of coordinating and working together on ensuring that this event comes to pass. And definitely last but not least, we also welcome, we'll do it again, but we welcome all our uh, panelists. Uh, we've got Professor Martin Sela, who is online. Um, Ms. Thunder, who's here with us as well, and uh, we've got Mr. Kulati as well uh, with us. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're really uh, hoping for a good engagement. And of course, I will get out of the way as a facilitator so that they can share with us their views about the current state of the country and why this conversation is critical at this point in time. Um, many of us were shocked about, you know, the results, etc. Uh, many. Um, postulations, etc. But this is where we are and what is in the role of business leaders and professionals and in particular what will be the role of the BMF and Henry uh, as well and the role of Good Governance Africa and the role of Stellenbosch University which is present here and the role of Wesco because all of these particular stakeholders have been brought here together not not of a figment of our imagination but they were carefully considered as to why they are here so we're not just here to talk ladies and gentlemen but we really would like to probably build consensus build ideas that we can implement and action collectively as the stakeholders represented here we're not just doing another event as we usually do in this country because this country is definitely um in a change mode so we also need to think that way so really really i'm looking forward to the ideas that will come out of the conversation without wasting any more time i would like to call on the acting president of the bmf to give us a bmf message and input as we kick start our conversation please welcome them like me. Good evening. Yeah. Are you well? Yes. Yeah. Can't tell us curious. <laughs> That's the one thing I can definitely say. And with excitement, we are here for leading beyond the ballot. When we got together and we're brainstorming on the theme. We were asking ourselves a lot of questions to say, what do we want to get out of this session? What kind of input do we want the people to give us? Because it's quite evident that you went to the press and your voice is quite clear of which direction you want this country to go. But how do we get there? 
So without wasting further time, thank you, MD. I want to welcome you all to leading beyond the the end. Must we change some height? Change this better. That's the best we say. Better. Speak. Better. <laughs> Those in the front can hear me. All right. So, leading beyond the ballot, shaping South Africa's post election future is what the conversation is about today. But, firstly, as the BMF, it is important that we congratulate all the political parties. <laughs> <laughs> on the outcomes of the elections. And just like everybody else, we are appealing that going so right, the negotiations and the talks that are going on behind the scenes, as possible coalition government. I, I can't get myself to say it because it's, it's new, it's unique. It's terms that have never been used at the same time, coalition government South Africa. So it's still a challenge for us to get used to it. But today's event is to discuss how important is this coalition government. But as the BMS, we are very passionate about empowerment and transformation. So this is the opportunity for us to discuss how do we want this government to carry on the transformation agenda and empowerment. So all South Africans, there are only certain ones for everybody who took the opportunity to come and vote. So I want to welcome you all and thank you, Yengi, so much for assisting us and working with us to make this event a success. And to the panelists, we need your input today. We need your analysis and to the members, this is an opportunity for us to discuss important issues that affect South Africa. So I'm hoping that we are going to have a great discussion and everybody is going to participate. And at the end of this event, we know that we will have an input on the shape and the direction of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mwabi. Um, okay, All right. Um, I'd like to take this time now to welcome onto the stage our distinguished panelists, and I will start with Professor Madoncela. Uh, who does not necessarily need an introduction uh, because she's definitely a household name. But one thing I um, would like to just highlight about her, uh, she's got a particular relationship with the BMF, very warm relationship with the BMF um, over the years. She's a friend of the BMF, and uh, we're truly grateful for her taking the time out of the busy schedule. I'm sure you've seen her commentary throughout the week um, around these issues. And of course, tonight, we are particularly interested to watch she has to say to us as, as professionals and business leaders in South Africa today. So ladies and gentlemen, um, the former public protector, please welcome uh, Professor Madoncela online. Um, can you please give her a round of applause? And uh, our second panelist, which I'll ask them to, to come and take a seat, uh, Ms. Stanley, who is the CEO of West Crow. Um, again, um, there's also a good relationship with West Crow. I know in the Western Cape, the BMF deployed its members to be part of the board of West Crow. And I think the CFO as well is a member of the BMF. So there is a particular relationship again with West Crow. We are grateful for your time and we look forward to your input, uh, Ms. Thunder. Uh, can you please give a round of applause? <laughs> uh, Mr. Patrick Kulate, um, he is the CEO of Good Governance uh, Africa, of Southern Africa, and uh, they particularly focus on governance issues, and they've recently launched a governance index, performance index, and uh, I'm sure you'll tell us all about that as well in terms of its application, etc. and he's also here 
as well to get questions and input around what the role has been of good governance Africa and of course we're growing a relationship with uh, the association as well uh, through the BMF and you are grateful for your time this evening and I look forward to your input in Dr. Kulat. Thank you very much. You're in. All right. Well, All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what we're going to do? There's about uh, four, two or three topics, and of course, there's there's others as well. Um, we know that we don't have a lot of time. But what we want to do is we're going to allow the panelists to give us their high level input. Um, and they can take between five to ten minutes, so it will give them space to breathe um, before we get into anything else. But give them five to ten minutes so that they can express themselves um, around the current situation and their input. But just the four areas which are particular interest generally tonight, which I'd like all of us to be thinking about. Number one is the economic implications of a coalition government. Um, understanding how the political landscape may shape the economy and business environment. Right. That's the first part. Number two, challenges and opportunities for professional managers and leaders exploring the evolving landscape and its impact on leadership roles. So that one comes into play also because of the mandate of the BMF, which is about the development of managerial leadership. So that part will always be there in our engagements. Number three, how then do we navigate uncertainty? Uh, what are the personal strategies for leaders to navigate the uncertainty that we find ourselves in and even potential uncertainty in the next coming months or so? And then the last portion, uh, what is the role of business in upholding democracy? So how do we examine uh, how businesses can contribute to advancing the gains of a hard-won democracy? So those are the four key areas um, that we'll be getting input from. And as you think through, as we think together, um, you're more than welcome and we'll get to the Q&A part as well. So without wasting any more time, we'll start with Professor Matt Doncella online for her input. Uh, so that she can lay the ground in terms of her perspective on um, leading beyond the ballot. Thanks, uh, Martin Sella. Uh, over to you. Oh, no. Well. Greetings. Okay. I think they're not... Can I have permission to... Use a video, please. Okay, thank you. Is that good? Yes. Okay, sorry, guys. Um, thank you for this privilege to BMF and Henley Business School for the opportunity to address this amazing event. And just thank you for the foresight to get intellectuals to begin to talk about these matters. Uh, people think politics are for politicians, but I think politics are for everyone because whatever happens will affect me and you. And in any event, if we don't engage, we will not be able to lend our politicians our ideas. They don't have to take our ideas, but at least we give them what we think uh, might be helpful. I have chosen to combine what you've asked me to talk about Sir, with my work here at Stellenbosch University, which is work on social justice. Wow. And, and therefore, I'm talking about social justice leadership factors in leading beyond the, the ballot. In so doing, I will talk a bit about good governance and, and ethics. Just lastly to say what has happened in the last few days has been paradoxically predictable yet unpredictable. And to that extent, organizations such as uh, Stellenbosch University, Henley Business School, Gibbs, and everyone need to work more closely with politicians around scenario planning. Mm -hmm. 
because as I said, it was both predictable and unpredictable. What was predictable was that the ANC might lose the election or at least might lose the majority. And there was a huge possibility of um, a coalition government. And last day in August already, we started talking about those possibilities. The second thing, uh, what was not predictable was that the main factor, if not the sole factor behind the ANC's vote shedding, as some have called it, (laughs) would be an internal split where one of its former presidents walks away with the deciding votes. You, if you look at the election results, you will realize that the ANC lost about 17 percentage points. Of those points, 15 percentage points are accounted for by a party formed by its former president taking the identity of the ANC's disbanded military wing, Mkwanto Wessis, were known as MK. And the rest are accounted for by political parties. So in, in some way, we're having the best of times, if I were to borrow it from Charles Dickens, and also the worst of times. The best of times is that this gives us an opportunity for a values reset, rethinking leadership, and le- rethinking leadership for good governance. Uh, a difficult challenge are the uncertainties that our colleague Monde has spoken about. And thirdly, South Africa cannot afford a future of too much uncertainty. Well, the markets don't like too much uncertainty. They do operate with uncertainties because to invest is to bet on uncertainties, but they normally just want contained uncertainties. But here's what's not in the public domain is that The people of this country have suffered for too long. If we don't make meaningful progress on poverty and equality, which would incorporate employment and income security, we are going to be in trouble. And I've been saying this since 2016 in, in writing, because when unattended, these become fatal ground for radicalization or extremism rampant crime, including corruption, and further social fracture in a country where there are already, these are already key political challenges. So just before I quickly deal with what do we do then going forward with good governance, I want to indicate to you that uh, two things happened to me and my colleagues before we did this. Firstly, I did some scenarios without using an algorithm. I am a trained scenario practitioner, and I was trained during those days before the way algorithms, so we could just look at trends. And I had come up with four scenarios at the time. And, and, and these scenarios, sort of one of them has more or less possibly penned out, or, or its possibility is quite strong now. So the the four scenarios were, the first scenario was a scenario where um, we had a a limping or a bruised or limping ANC. So bruised or limping would be an ANC that still has 50 plus 1% or or at least 49 point something like it did in the Northern Cape. And it would be able to, to govern humbled and it would it would be able to do better on corruption because it has realized that it nearly lost. For me, that was my best case scenario when I addressed um, the banking industry in, in Namibia. And the second, at the time, in a very weird way, I thought the DA was the second best case scenario. The second person in a DNA and C marriage. Uh, so that was for me um, an uncomfortable, uncomfortable co pilots because it would have been a very difficult relationship, but I thought it would it, it, it would work. The third, the worst case scenario for me was a scenario that brought 
backstage captures. So my own view was any relationship that brings in MK party would bring backstage capture. And the last scenario was the MK was the MPC, which I thought that would be um uh, social justice shot out scenario simply because of their aversion to social justice, traditional or classical social justice, things like employment rights, which have been the focus of social justice since 1919, when the Treaty of Versailles highlighted social justice is the reason why we had the First World War and established the ILO to make sure that there's social justice between labor and capital. So I was also concerned that they showed no interest in social support, which is the grant. Again, it is not a solution to people being given uh, livelihoods, whether it's unemployment or whether it's employment or working for themselves or um, uh, subsistence farming, you know, there's so many options of livelihoods that people don't think about when they say jobs and jobs and jobs. So I was worried about that. Uh, so, but initially I thought this was worth a short, but after we, the second thing we did was we looked at political party manifestos against the Bill of Rights. We did 30 days of democracy dialogues where people told us what they thought about the Bill of Rights, the preamble, which includes social justice, the venues, which include the achievement of equality, and then the rest of the Bill of Rights, which includes um, a administrative law and, and everything. And we, we ended up with people giving us eight concerns that we were concerned about. And, and these ranged from uh, land rights and housing, to issues such as crime and criminality, GPV and, and the courts, actually, the handling of courts by of, of, of crime and criminality, and people concerned about equality, people concerned about economic inclusion, et cetera. Based on that, then I was now concerned about what's going to happen uh, from uh, if the ANC and the A and, and, and the DA got married, just rightly to just mention very strictly, it was land, housing, and related rights, migration, economic inclusion, and parity, equality in all areas of la of life, including parity of esteem, social security, including the SRD grant, human dignity, education, access to justice, particularly regarding GPV and other violent crime, health services, and equitable distribution of community infrastructure. And then we measured eight of these parties against that, and we found some of them wanting. And of course, there were those that we found wanting for extremism, wanting, for example, expropriation of land without a conversation. But with the EFF, it was interesting because our finding was that the EFF says to do that, it will change the constitution. So it's not just saying it's going to ride rough short over the constitution. It will change the constitution, which means it needs a two-thirds majority, which is not likely to happen. And we were concerned, of course, we didn't evaluate MK party because having chosen a parliamentary democracy, then it meant there'll be no Bill of Rights and there would be no ability for you and me to challenge them in court when our human rights have been violated. So uh, progress, such as we've had, for example, HIV medication through the TAC cases, social security being extended to domestic workers, et cetera, would not be possible under MK party because of parliamentary supremacy. So we left them alone. Little did we know that they will end up being the wild card that changes everything. So where we are now, um, we are really in the scenario of, we're in a place where all possible scenarios are there except the, the moon short one because they only, they got less than 30% as a moon short. So that scenario is totally out of question. In terms of good governance, I did say we are having the worst of times and the best of times borrowing from, from Charles Dickens. What is the best of times? Is that the only thing that binds us now is the constitution. Nobody is a majority. Yes, the ANC has most of the votes, but 
And there's so many discrepancies in terms of what parties want to prioritize. So my view would be what needs to be prioritized is the constitution. Then the eight principles of good governance is propounded by the United Nations. And one of those principles is uh, equality. But another is decision-making by consensus. I'm not mentioning all of them, but the ones that are crucial here would be uh, equity or equality. And then the other one is decision-making by consensus. So what does this mean for growth and, and opportunity is in, and, and navigating uncertainty? From us at Stonebush University and the Tuma Foundation, we offer a particular kind of leadership that without that leadership, we don't think they're going to make it. They will need to lead uh, in a manner that is ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and committed to serve. And on the ethics, they have to decide up front what will be the values that bind them. And I suggest that they start with Section 1 of the Constitution, Section 195 of the Constitution, and those who are in the executive should aid Section 96 and, and 136. They should also add the value of Ubuntu, which um, the BMF is very passionate about Ubuntu because Ubuntu is um, understanding that really we are interconnected as human beings and we're interconnected with the rest of the world and with our environment. If I help you, I'm helping myself. If I harm you, I harm myself. But also Ubuntu tells us that we all have equal value, as the judges said in S versus McGuinion. And that equal value will regard us, will require us to respect the constitution, to respect the value of the achievement of equality. And I've got stats here that my team prepared, I can share with them later. That just shows that we are not yet equal. On land, for example, Africans own, according to the last data, they own only 4% of, of, of rural land. And, um, and that can't be right. We can't have people say that that can be remedied by giving people their ownership certificates to their cuckoos or, or their shacks or their four-roomed houses. That's good, but that's not always good because if you, all you own is a home and you don't have any livelihood, the first thing that's going to go away our homes. So one of the anger points in this province where I am is gentrification, where people are losing their homes because the rates are going higher without improvements to the properties, but they're going higher because other people are even are able to buy and people are losing their homes. So if you're not helping people with livelihoods and giving them uh, and making sure that they own their home and it's properly certified is good, but it is not enough. So lastly, just to say, we are going through, paradoxically, the best of times and the worst of times. But the good thing is it's an opportunity for a values reset. And another good thing is that that values reset does not mean that we should come up with anything new. The Constitution already gives us the values that should bound us, and that include the values that underpin Ubuntu. And when it comes to leadership, we do need confident leadership. And President Ramaphosa, at least according to Harvard University, uh, or according to one of the Harvard professors, Professor Rosaketh Moskanter, is one of those confident leaders that can negotiate with others in a way that embraces their humanity and treats them as equals. He's a person that can make sure that everyone feels hate, everyone's contribution is, is valued. I hope he remembers being able to do that because then maybe he is just our hope. Thank you. Without your planning, I think there's a great opportunity there for great collaboration in terms of going forward, how we can look at uh, scenario planning um, as the organization. And the value set is also another critical point of discussion. How do we then uh, have a values reset, et cetera? Um, and um, quite interesting views about the parliamentary democracy, et cetera. But yeah, some key things there that we will come back to. But let me, like I said, I must get out of the way. So, Dada Kulati, um, your opening remarks uh, and your reflections about uh, where we are, especially on those four points that I started with. Over to you, sir. 
you call. You hear me? All right. Good evening, everyone. Excuse me, I used to be a teacher. So, <laughs> so as teachers, we like to move around a little bit. I hope you bear with me. I'd just like to acknowledge the professor, like acknowledge everyone who is here, the leadership of Hanley and, and, and the BMF, uh, two organizations that have uh, paved the way for the development of leadership in this continent, and particularly in South Africa. And I'd like to appreciate the invitation and uh, to appreciate being part of this panel. I want to do two things. Uh, tell two stories and then raise some questions. I think Professor Madonzela and I seem to have been in the same room, at least thinking about what to say today. Firstly, I was with her on ENCA earlier. Today we're here, next week I'm gonna be back in Stellenbosch with her again. So, and it sounds like we shared some thoughts along the way, although we've never met. <laughs> so, I was asked a few weeks ago to speak at an anti-corruption conference, which uh, Good Governance Africa held together with the Africa, African Organization of uh, Supreme Audit Institutions as well as other organizations. And in that uh, keynote address that I was giving, I used a metaphor which I'd like to start off with, or an analogy, that's the first story, to make a point. Good to see my friends here, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. One of the things that I enjoy doing is to watch nature documentaries. So one day I was watching one of those nature documentaries and there was this herd of buffalo gallivanting and running in the wild and two animals were tracing them. In a choreographed kind of way, they were really trying to get to isolate one of these, of these uh, buffalo that were running and and fortunately for them, they managed to track one and isolate him yeah. to such an extent that the others left and these two lions, the one held the buffalo by the throat, the other held the buffalo by the mouth. So neither could it breathe, nor could it shout and cry. It tried by all means to stand strong, but the power of these uh, ferocious predators really was overwhelming. And it, for, for minutes, maybe 10 minutes, it stood still fighting against the power of these wild lions. And ultimately it gave up under the, and it collapsed under this, under this, this attack. So as they started to nibble, because they were also starting to rest, because now it was down, they thought they had him. And as they started to try and nibble, the herd that had gone turned around, and it came back. One of them gored one of the lions, and in no time, the lions ran away. I'm going to make a point soon, so bear with me. Thanks, <laughs> Both those lions ran away. And after some time, maybe a couple of seconds, the buffalo realized that the enemy had gone. It felt the air running through its body and it started to stand up. Bruised, yes, bloodied, battered, but it still stood. It was wounded. It was, you know, it had been tired but it still, it still stood and it went and joined. As it did, it was limping. When I think of that, and I, th and I think of South Africa, and indeed the African continent, it has been traced, tracked, and attacked by two sets of lion-like enemies, right. the private sector and the public sector people in leadership. They have ransacked the public press. They have done a lot of things 
If you look at the mining, if you look at everywhere, without investing anything into the country, such that the country, there were moments when this country almost looked like it was collapsing, but it had stood battered, yes, bruised, yes, almost without breath, but it stood. And here we are today, election after election, with this democracy standing still, not because of anyone else, but because of the power and the voices of its people, because of the marches and the protests of ordinary people, because of the marches and the protests of business organizations and business leaders, but also because of the chapter nine institutions that stood against the onslaught of corruption and all the stuff that was happening. And so we ought to be thankful that we even had an election. And after that election, we had the governing party, not even complaining, not even saying anything. We can blame them for anything. But for that, I give them credit that they said we have been, we have been squarely just not been given the kind of majority that we wanted. We're now going to look for partners to partner with. We need to thank the fact that the, our democracy stood after this election. It still remains strong, resilient. And I think Professor McDonnell has talked about the power and the importance uh, of the Constitution. Such that last Sunday, <clears throat> As I was thinking about and watching the TV, people were talking, I started writing an article that evening. I couldn't sleep because I had these two ideas that I thought about. The first idea was <clears throat> there is a lesson for both politicians and for citizens out of this election. In fact, any election. The first lesson for politicians is that Electoral popularity or electoral, yes, popularity has a price to pay. And then if you don't pay that price, people are going to come after you. I make an example in that article, I think it's going to be published or it's published already by News 24. I make an example about two presidents. We have two, one was Prime Minister of Armenia, I just can't say his name. In 20, 2018, that man was the darling of his people. He led, literally walked distances and overthrew the government democratically. He was lifted to the shoulders of people. Today, today, even last Sunday, there was an article in the Guardian newspaper that those very same people want him out of power. There's a price to pay for politicians when they don't deliver the mandate that the people want from them. The second illustration I make, it's about President Ramaphosa himself. Because remember Tumamina, the, the, the marches that he did, the, 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 all the walks that he did next to the beach, everywhere he went, people all over him, such that commentators talked about Ramaphoria, the effect that he had on people. But today, the very same people gave him 40% far below even the capacity to be able to form a government. I mean, right? Politicians must never take people for granted. Then there's a second lesson for us as citizens, that now that we've participated in the elections, yeah. showing in marches into the night, into the cold, that we are concerned about the direction of our country, we are concerned about the democracy. We want this democracy to grow and we want it to stand strong. We went to the voting polls. Now it means therefore we must not disengage anymore. We must not leave the stage of engagement because good governance, as, as the professor was saying, has seven elements. One of those elements is participation. It is about accountability. It is transparency. It is things like ethical leadership. And so all those things are gonna happen only as we as citizens stay engaged, make sure that we hold them to account, be active in parliament, be active when there are bills, businesses like, uh, business organizations like BMF, we need to stay engaged so that they know that they are accountable to all of us. Second story I want to say is around 2003, 
All right, it looks much younger than, than now. <laughs> a group of us, we're, we're coming from various backgrounds. I was in environmental justice then, uh, working at UCT at the Environmental Evaluation Unit. Other people are coming from engineering. Others were coming from law. We even had this, the, the son of the man who established Orania. And people from the ANC, unions, DA, everyone, they were there. We were put together by the Africa Leadership Institute, the United Nations Organization, as well as the University of Western Cape, to develop scenarios of how South Africa was likely to look in 2020. And so we said, all those years ago, okay, and how this country could look like. And when the prof was talking about scenario planning, we were doing scenario plans. So those were non fleur scenarios. Because we met in a farm, on a farm here in Stellenbosch. That farm was called Montfleur. The first group of, uh, of, of people that were part of this scenario planning included people like Trevor Manuel, people like Sakima Tozo, uh, Tito Mboweni, and others in 1992 as the country was leading to 1994. And so we were brought in in 2002, 2003, because the country was going into 2020, 2004 elections to say, how do we see South Africa into the next, uh, I don't know how many years. We came up with four scenarios. And I want to mention some of them quickly. And this is the report that came out of that. Uh, out of that scenario, you can still find it online. The first scenario was called a dead end. It was called a dead end. This explored the outcome, the possible outcome of a self-serving leadership, individualistic leaders, People that did not care as long as we can make it and we can be rich, we don't care about the rest of the people. Rampant individualism. The scenario paints a picture of South African malaise with individualism, high levels of corruption, and a slow pace of reform. So that was the first scenario that we came up with. We believe that that scenario would be the worst for the country. Then the second scenario was a slow punch, a slow puncher. All so, right, slow puncher. It's just like uh, this. Uh, we, we, we explored the possible outcome of South Africa choosing to beat the same path rather than adopting a bold vision and decisive leadership to reduce inequality. And they preferred not to rock the boat. They're just going to. So, as I read and as I mention all of these uh, scenarios, you're going to find that South Africa has experienced bits and pieces of all of them because we have indeed had experienced some of these problems. So this results in some sort of a country that is not going anywhere, that's actually dying, that's not growing economically, poverty is not being addressed, people, young people are not expired, education is collapsing, all of those problems, it's a slow puncher. Did I say puncher? Puncher. <laughs> it's at night. I think in Corsa at this time. <laughs> <laughs> then there is a sharp right turn. That was a third uh, thing where the government says we're sick and tired of this thing. We, we're not going to care about social grants. We're not going to care about social development. We just want economic growth no matter what happens. We're going to go into the world. We want to be liked by the investors. We just want people to come here and build the mines and take the income and go. And we don't care about social development. Sharp turn to the right. The one that we all agreed that we thought was important now, let me say this before I say the last one that we, we, we liked. As South Africans, we don't seem to learn. Yeah. Our leaders don't listen in order to learn. Many people have been saying things, scholars, people in the NGO sectors, communities have been saying a lot of things. Change direction, stop the corruption. 
Stop this crass individualism. This careless, I don't care attitude. Stop it. Yeah. And for those of us who are in business, who happen to drive the latest cars, and we drive into the townships that we, grow in, we grew up into, without the care of other people, people don't like that. They resent that kind of thing, especially when we don't invest and give back to those communities. And so the one that we really agreed on was, uh, uh, where is this now? I just forget. Um, I thought I'd written it down here, but it doesn't seem that I had written it down, but I've got it here. It's called All Aboard the Dual Carriage Way. Okay. This one examined how, the can how South Africa as a country uh, challenges its approach to growth and development and chooses a bold path to enable all to climb aboard this dual carriage way to a better life. This was not going to leave other people behind. So it needed a bold set of leadership. Prof was talking about Ubuntu. It needed these characteristics, a just society, Ubuntu, inclusive economy, social delivery, environment for creativity. These were the things that we agreed at the time, but unfortunately, no one listened to those. We did everything to popularize them. We even had a person of the ANC within that group called uh, uh, Phoebe Potkiter. We thought that because she's there, she was going to make it, you know, but it was not taken up by any of those people. So as I sit down, <laughs> I just want to make these points and uh, I'm going to take my seat. The outcomes of our, election, our elections show a maturing democracy. And we need to give ourselves a round of applause for that as a country. This point was made very clear to me on Tuesday. I had a meeting with the Swiss ambassador. And because in uh, Europe, this thing of coalition is new, is old. <laughs> he just said to me, you don't need to be worried. <laughs> This thing is a maturing democracy. Something good is going to come out of this thing. You just need to learn. So let's not be worried. It's an opportunity for us to learn. That things must change urgently. Things must change urgently. I was going to share two stories, but I won't because of time. Just to put this point. <laughs> <laughs> to put this point. This new leadership that's coming now, Instead of sitting in those meetings of trying to craft and divvy up, you know, who's going to get what position? I want finance department. I want home affairs. There's no time for that. <laughs> There's no time for that. People are desperate out there. They need the, to hear the leadership saying, we've discussed, we come out, here is a vision for the country. We're going to take these Decisive, decisive actions to grow the economy, to address poverty, to increase uh, employment, create uh, you know uh, people, income generation activities. That is what the country needs. Not these people to come into parliament and decide which positions they're going to take. I'm going to stop there for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kulati. I won't waste any further time. I know we're here for a particular time, so I'll quickly hand over to Ms. Tanda to give her an opportunity as well to, to reflect and what she wants to also add to the conversation. Over to you, uh, Ms. Tanda. Thank you very much, Mondi. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so Mondi stole my party trick um, at the office when the staff, when I greet the staff and they do this good evening and they just go good evening, you know, so you stole my party trick. Um, but I did also want to say that I started at Wesker about two and a half years ago and I chose Tuli Madansela um, to speak at our at my inaugural address. Um, and uh, um, uh, it was it was absolutely fabulous. And the reason that I chose Tuli Madansela was because of her integrity and her ethical leadership. So for me, that was um, really, really important. So I'm really delighted to be, um, you know, sharing this uh, panel with her again today. But 
2024 is uh, probably one of the most significant years for democracy in the world. Uh, 60 nations, which is half of the world's population, is going to the polls. And this is going to have um, a ripple effect on South Africa. It's going to have an impact on the whole world. So if you just think about the key markets, I mean, the US is going uh, to elections and God knows who's going to win there because, of course, uh, Donald Trump is being victimized. You know, he's... Uh, he's um, you know, he's got that victim uh, thing going and, you know, that probably will mean he's going to win. Um, of course, all eyes are on that election. It's quite important. The Russians are going to elections, but of course that's a one, one person race, uh, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> you know, the United Kingdom, I think there's a lot of tension there because Labour Party is poised to take over from the Conservative Party. And then in India, I mean, our election took place over one day. In India, it takes place over months because they've got trillions of people, you know, they've got trillions of people. So that is probably the biggest election in the world that's taking place. But I think in South Africa, it's not since the dawn of democracy in 1994 that the quality of conversations matter. I think right now it's really, really important that the politicians put the needs and interests of the country ahead of the um, party manifestos and ahead of the, you know, uh, 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 I suppose what it is that they want. We got this right um, at Cadessa. And that is where opposing parties were able to engage in dialogue and they were able to hold the paradox of opposing views. Um, I think. For me, the most important thing, and I can't say this enough, is that business and civil society need to take up their roles. For me, you know, the the uh, and you know, I think it's really, really important. It's a bit like a tricycle. So it's a tricycle where civil society, business, and government um, impact the future of the of of the country. We cannot leave it. As citizens, as business people, we cannot leave it to government alone. We've done that for too long. And I think that, you know, we need to guard our democracy jealously. Um, I do want to, I think, maybe just comment on the fact, yes, I'm going to need one of those. I do need to comment on the fact that um, our elections were free and fair. And I think one of the previous speakers spoke about the fact that, um, you know, Thankfully, there's no big fight over, you know, it, it's, it's free and fair. And we have to, we really, really do have to give ourselves a pat on the back for that. But I do want to come back to um, a, a little bit more specifically on, on civil society. We have to take our role. We cannot sit on the sideline and watch our country fall apart. We simply cannot. I was saying to people that, you know, if I go into politics or if I become an activist again, then it will be because we need to. And I think we need to do that. When it comes to business, I'm pleased that business is coming to the party. You know, there's there's been some work happening through NECOM um, where there's a, 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 you know, look at ESCOM and, and trying to resolve the energy crisis. Um, there's the National um, Logistics um, Crisis Committee where the private sector is also looking at dealing with some of the, 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 the issues at, at Transnet. And then, of course, there's um, a committee looking after crime and corruption. So that is where the public and the private sector are working together in partnership. I feel that, or I believe that, uh, private sector participation is the new normal, and that the private sector needs to redefine the way the way that they engage with government. We, it's an equal relationship between the private sector, government, and civil society, and we've got to take our roles. Um, and and uh, and I think that that is quite important when it comes to government. What I'd like to see is visionary ethical and accountable leadership. And I think we need to hold government accountable. And to some extent we have. Um, and I think and I think that's great. Um, the Obviously, the way that the uh, elections affect the economy, um, I think you know that is going to be something that we need we need to consider. But if you look at 
what's happening globally um, and some of the global uh, political uh, risks, then geopolitics is actually the biggest the, the biggest risks impacting the global economy at the moment. So you've got, uh, you know, the middle the United States imploding, uh, you know, within itself. The Middle East is in a very difficult situation. There's the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, there's, you know, there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of I suppose geopolitical uncertainty at the moment, and we will see how that plays out. But coming back to South Africa, um, obviously the, the future is coalitions, um, and we're going to need to figure out how that works. I'm confident um, that we're resilient, um, and I think that if we hold government accountable, then it certainly can work. We haven't had a good track record to date. Um, if you look at coalition governments around the country, you know, Gauteng is... I mean, Gauteng is the heartland of the country, of the economy, but it is struggling. Um, you know, services are not being delivered. Um, and this is because coalitions have not worked yet. Um, but so there's a lot of work. And I think that we probably have to prepare for a tough couple of weeks, months, and probably years. But I'm quite certain we will get through it. Um, of course, uh, some of the earlier speakers have spoken about the um, political uh, climate is impact markets, and we've already seen the RAND, you know, uh, being really, really volatile in equity indices of experienced declines. So we're already seeing it. But I'm confident that South Africa is resilient. We've got a strong constitution with entrenched rights. We've got an independent judiciary, an independent constitutional court, free media, um, strong institutions like the Reserve Bank, Treasury, uh, South African Revenue Services. We've got a well-regulated financial sector, and there is more engagement from the private sector. I don't feel civil society is in the place where it needs to be. We need to work on that. Um, and, um, you know, we've all spoken about some of the possible um, coalitions. Some are more appealing to the markets. Some are more appealing to, to you know, to, to the constituents. I do feel that the single biggest risk for South Africa uh, and for the Western Cape is poverty and unemployment. Mm -hmm. And economic growth is not enough. It needs to be inclusive mm -hmm. economic growth. But I think fundamentally we need to grow the pie. And in order to grow the pie, we are going to need visionary leadership. We're going to need good governance. We're going to need a competent administration that is able to deliver, but that is also innovative. Uh, we are going to need that collaboration between the public and the private sectors. It's absolutely critical. We need it. Um, and then we are going to have to focus on some of those industries which absorb um, young people and which absorbs people with lower skill levels. Um, and certainly if I look at just the Western Cape, the two sectors that are, are doing that, the one is tourism, um, and we've seen that a lot of young people are, are, are able to be employed in that sector. And then also uh, business process outsourcing, which is your call centers. I mean, it is growing in the Western Cape. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, and so what we have seen is that, you know, there is a little bit of a tapering off of, of unemployment in the province. Um, and uh, But there's a lot of work to do. So I just want to throw in that. Um, you know, you mentioned that Sandisa is a member of your uh, committee, um, and uh, Sandisa and I are very proud that we have absorbed 17 interns um, into West Grove, and we've absorbed them across the agency, and you will not believe the quality and the talent that we've managed to find. Uh, graduates from Stellenbosch, graduates from UCT, graduates from UWC, Cape, uh, you know, CPUT. Um, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic uh, set of people um, that that are being exposed to 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 the world of work, and we're going to have to do more of that. I was an intern many years ago, and I'm absolutely passionate about making sure that wherever I go, they are interns. Um, and we need to make sure that we each, we all do that. 
um, because our young people need to be employed. I cannot believe the levels of unemployment. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you can get a graduate from these universities to come and, you know, it's just, yeah. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're also looking at the time, and uh, of course, we want more time for the Q&A as well. So we are allowed our panelists to really breathe so that we don't rush them, and uh, that is deliberate, right? So so that you give them the enough air time to really think through some of the issues. So there are a lot of key issues that have come out um, around, around it, and I was just rechecking my notes again just to refresh um, Prof. Martonsella's points, um, but there's one in particular, uh, Prof. We will go back to Prof. And uh, I'll probably ask just one question each, starting from Prof. And then coming this way, and then I'll open up for Q and A. But I think uh, Prof. Martonsella, out of all the points that you mentioned, I think. Uh, Apart from the scenario issue, which I think is a room for us to speak about more post this conversation, but you mentioned the issue of the of the land and four percent. How how do we how do we begin to deal with that matter as professionals who are sitting here? How do we assist government, um, the incoming government, whoever is going to be, in dealing with that specific issue? One of the issues that the former president also raised through his report, uh, high-level panel report of parliament in 2017. This is former president Kharaba Mutande. Again, land is another key challenge. So I think, you know, let's not shy away from it. How, how do we begin to deal with it as professionals, as these organizations that are, that are here uh, this evening? Prof, over to you. This Thank you, Chair, for that question, and congratulations to colleagues for bringing different pieces of the puzzle. The land question needs to be placed in the context of, do we accept the pyramid society? And I want to challenge West Crow here and challenge the DA government is you seem to be suggesting if we give people employment, if we give people uh, if we give people employment in particular, our problem is solved. No, ma'am, it is not solved. I mean, as a pub protector, I also created a whole lot of internship jobs, which is a very great thing. And and they saw the assistant public protectors, uh, assistant investigators. Now at Stanbush University, we have five interns and they were being paid four point minimum wage by the by yes. youth capital. They came to us complaining that just to get accommodation, a two a two bedroom, one room, a student accommodation with two beds, is five thousand rand per bed. So, so employment is not our answer, and I always say to white people in this country, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna put it as a risk. Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't have joined the struggle. Well, I didn't join the struggle to give the next generation of black South Africans jobs. Because at the time when we, we, we joined the struggle, there was no problem with jobs, guys. This is the ages. There was an abundance of jobs. The issue was sharing this country as equals. Land. So what I would like to see from West Grove, in addition to um, is I would like to see like the Gauteng propeller. I would like you to say how many people like Batu, like Batu, have you created? Mm. How many Porsche M's have you have you supported? Yeah. What's your township a uh, business development process? I love you as a person, Renal. I love the premier. I said earlier that um, uh, I did say he's a man, and I wasn't saying it for public consumption. I really think he's a good person. But we have to agree, are we rapturing Cecil John Rhodes' pyramid scheme to build a diamond society? Are, are we walking together that path? Or are some of us saying, let's keep the diamond and create jobs? The truth is these jobs are not sustainable. I live in Stellenbosch. A lot of them are seasonal workers. So let's take poverty statistics. Across the board now, Chair, 
poverty is now at 60% after COVID-19. This whole idea of assumption that growth, growth automatically uh, it translates into ending poverty is not true. Because in terms of growth, in terms of our GDP, we're back to where we were before COVID-19. But in terms of poverty, we're not back to where we were. Because some of the growth is that some of the businesses that were resilient during COVID have grown bigger. So big businesses have grown bigger, small business sheltered. So we need to be intentional about targeting everyone and meeting where they are. And this land question, Oh, God, people cried during the 30 days of democracy, guys. And these are young people. They cried about land. So we, this country is not going to work if 30 years into democracy, our young intellectuals, the people who are crying, young intellectuals, are still having so black years lamentation, which was 110 years ago. So what do we do? It's, this expropriation and without compensation is just a political ploy. It's not going to get us anywhere because firstly, it's not targeting all of land, but also we don't want our land owned by the state. I mean, it's the land that has been owned by the state so far has not been distributed equitably. So the starting point actually is to look at the land that has belonged to the state since 1994, BMF. Can we find out how was it distributed by local government, by provinces, and by national? Can we find out who have been the beneficiaries post-1994 of land, of, of the distribution of state land? My instinct is that it's it's, re, it's reproduced. In some places, it's reproduced the disparities of the past. But the second thing is facilitate a process as BMF to talk to white business. A lot of people, especially the church-going kind of people, are prepared to engage. I mean, I've discovered that they play they play our rigged monopoly game these days. We invented a game called the rigged monopoly game to explain what happened in 1894, 1913, and 1950. And I'm told now that church people are playing, the church leaders are getting their own members to play that rigged monopoly game to get people to understand that asking for restitution is not punishment, is not vindictiveness. It's just mathematically, those who have been separated from and those who have been added to will never be equal unless you rupture the inequality. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, even on this issue, I mean, we could we would go to town with it. Um, I think, let me also be fair, you challenge West Crow. Um, uh, maybe, Ms. Thunder, if you want to respond to the challenge. Um, you accept the challenge. So it's it's on record, Prof. Yeah, I accept um, the challenge, but yeah. I, I should just, Prof, West Crow is not DA. <laughs> um, I think that, um, you know, there, there was a time when, when the ANC ruled the province um, and, you know, West Crow works, so we apolitical. Um, and, of course, we, uh, whichever political party comes in, you know, we need to we need to work with with those parties. But our role is to is I suppose to lift the tide, um, and so that's our mandate um, is, is to grow the economy and to and 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 I think that the most important thing is to do that inclusively. But I do agree with Prof. I mean, it may not, may not be something we can do, but it certainly is something that I certainly do agree with. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, BMF acting president, you 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 had the challenge yeah. that BMF needs to um, find out what happened to state land post ninety four, and secondly for BMF to engage a, a business in a structured way around um, some of these matters. So so it's on record. Okay, and uh, Tatukulate, um, I think just briefly as well from a governance perspective i think just briefly take us through the application of your index um, so that we get a, a, an appreciation of what that is about and and its implication as well thank you thank you chair I, i'm tempted just to, to to say a few words on what prof said okay you can go ahead because really it's a it's a nub of everything i i used to work um, here in the western cape um running a program called a small-scale small 
a small scale farm project where we would build uh, JVs between small scale farmers in places like Picketberg, you know, those people that were planting uh, uh, rooibos tea and buhu and all of that. Uh, so you would go to uh, to the farmer, call them white farmers, a white farmer, and say this is a group of people that uh, want to learn. So they, they had a grant then that was called Eldred Grant, Land and Agrarian Grant from the government. So they would pull together and buy. And so the farmer would then give them access to water resources, the you know, all of that, but also the market. So that project was very good up until we had a problem with extension services of the Department of Agriculture and the support to those farmers to make sure that they are able, they attend the meetings, they farm, they learn that. And I think there's a lesson here for governments when things like that, that can be seen to be working. Because you remember Roy Posti at the time, it was, it was sold in Europe. So these farmers already had the market. So all they did was to buy from the, far, from the, from the farmers, small farmers, and then sell it on. So I think there's a point to be made about the need to support when there are small black uh, businesses that are trying to make it. Because people need, they don't need a handout. They need support. There's already in a lot of people that aspire to be doing a lot of things. Now, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your governance performance index. Oh, okay. Okay, good governance Africa is, uh, is we believe in an Africa where governments are effective, where poverty is addressed, where businesses thrive, and um, where everybody is being brought to. We believe that Africa has all the resources, including natural and resources and people. And so then governments and businesses then tend to use those resources. Then good governance comes in to say, how do you use those resources in order to achieve these objectives? Because so on the one side of our theory of change, we've got what we call government effectiveness, and then another axis is called societal improvement. So our um, uh, government performance index looks into the local governments to assess how they are delivering on uh, about eight dimensions. You, you talk about, you talk about uh, uh, pub, uh, public services, leadership, management, you know, uh, you know, dealing with corruption, all of those kinds of things. And so we use data that's coming from the, uh, a number of data sources, including the, um, the Auditor General. Um, and then we then rank them to check how do they perform against each of these things, particularly around the issues of uh, job creation or income and uh, creation and all of those kinds of things. So we're finding that, uh, like if you go to Bizana, from Bizana in the in the in the Eastern Cape, our team went there after the, we did the first uh, the first GPI or government performance index where they performed badly on all those areas, and so our team went in to work with them. It was difficult because the politicians who, were, who did not like these outsiders and all of that kind of stuff. But ultimately, our team uh, managed to get through. When we did this, this one that we did now, Bizana performed much, much better. Uh, because what the, 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 the local authorities need is support. Because a lot of them uh, are so encumbered by meetings, uh, by things that are not relevant for what they need to do. So if you remove a lot of that kind of stuff and get them to do what they need to do, then, then, then and you also have a situation in the local authorities where a lot of the leadership are not trained are not like they do not they're not qualified in anything uh, and so they are then decision makers on top of a professional 
and that professional cannot do anything because this is their leader. And in the in the community, you know, the 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 person who works under this manager here, but in the location in the political party, they are your branch chair. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? So those things are coming out in the in the GPI to show that. But if uh, if government, local government, is supported, is monitored, is evaluated, people feel the need to improve the next time. So that report, all that all that report does is to is to is to serve as a as a mirror to say this is how your municipality has performed against these dimensions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kolatim. My my last question before I open up for a Q and A, um, Ms. Thunder, you. You mentioned um, the Codesa moment, which happened very well. Do you think that this could be another opportune moment for another Codesa moment in South Africa? And what are your views about that? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, and I think that that is the opportunity that presents itself, and I think that our leaders need to take that. Um, I don't. I mean, I. You know, it's 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 really you know. So there's obviously a lot to talk about the government of national unity. It talks about collaboration between the ANC and the DA. That is, you know, that's popular amongst business, but I don't think that's necessarily popular amongst people because because of the issues that uh, I think uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Madam Senator raised. Um, you know, it's not a part. It's a, you know, it's not a, a coalition that'll work that well. Mm -hmm. um, then you've obviously got uh, you know, so there are a whole range of different uh, opportunities and options. And I certainly hope that our leaders are going to be wise. That they're going to apply their wisdom and do the right thing, whatever that is. I, I think it's a, it's an unenviable um, task at hand, um, but, but we, need to, we need to make the right decision for so that. So what you did. Thank you very much to our panelists. Please give them a round of applause. I will open up now for Q&A. Um, I need to look at my seniors here so that they can tell me how much time I have. Yeah. They said I must check my phone. It's, that, that, that. It, it's on flight mode. Yeah. It, yeah. Okay, I can take the first hand while I remove it from flight mode. Uh, yes, sir. You'll be the first. Two, three, and we'll take the first three. Whilst I, whilst I double check how much time we, we have. But, one of your members. <laughs> no, I won't. Don't worry. Don't worry. Please mention your name, um, the company you come from, and your question, and who it's directed to. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I I think. Oh, let me stand up. I think my my question uh, stroke comment is necessarily directed to the panelists. Two things that are a discontent to me, which we we seem not to be focusing on. And I've been listening to all the scenarios or most of the scenarios that we have. The first one is that when I went to, into my vote station, when I came out, I noticed the people who were mending the stall for the ANC, I know them. And all of them are working in parliament. So I quip to them that they are actually not volunteers, they are on duty. <laughs> because they are the members of the ANC who work in parliament. And it just dawned on me that these people for 30 years have been under one employer and their employer now is getting lesser of the share. And how much are they ready yeah. for a collision as my mother would say, and I keep on saying to her, it's not collusion. <laughs> uh, well, uh, how, how much are they ready? Do we have civil servants who've got a new mindset? But, and we seem, all of us, we seem not to be focusing on that. And when I was still in BMF, we still had chapters in the civil servant. We, we had chapters in parliament, I know, here, and in the city of Cape Town also. Because what, unless we begin to deal with civil servants, it is them 
by and large, who have allowed the state that we are, we seem to be focusing on politicians, not on governance. Because when the politicians come and go, and people who are in governance are there longer, they outlive politicians. And so I want to challenge BMF then to begin to have chapters and to have this kind of sessions that are saying, but what kind of a civil servant should we be? into that instance and not focus only on, on politicians. That's the first one. The second one is 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 necessarily based on on if 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 we were to take a, an exercise and ask everyone who is professionals who are professionals who are here, what is the vision of South Africa? We will surely get different answers. <laughs> And the old book says, where there is no vision, people perish. And what necessarily it means there, it, it means people will always be now in collusion because it depends who's loud, it's depend, it depends who's doing what. Unless we have a vision, a common vision as South Africans, and when we vote, we don't vote personalities, and we don't vote because we are tired of ANC, but we, have, we will be voting because we think that this organization, this person, can be able to push the vision. And it's amazing for me that BMF has got a vision, Westcrow has got a vision, and Good Governance Africa has got a vision, but our country does not have vision. And the economy that have grown, China, the UAE, and all of them have come up with a common vision, and everyone is pursuing that particular vision. And unless we as professionals drive our country into having a vision, what, what are we following? What are we pushing? Yes, at times, it, now it's a fair. If we need jobs, we're going to follow jobs. If we need our economy, or who's shouting more that we are following? And we're not going anywhere. We should have learned it over the past 30 years. Thank you very much, uh, my elder. I think it was more of a comment <laughs> than a question. Um, Thank you very much. I, I know the PMF is taking notes, so I won't put the leadership on the spot. The, quickly, my brother. Um, hi there, everyone. My name is Arthur Mexico. I'm the CEO of Access Network Africa. I'm a youth leader at multiple youth organizations and a proud member of BMF. Um, what I wanted us to spend, uh, what I wished we could have spent time on today, and uh, the question that I'm posing to the panel is, how can we have metrics put in place for us to be able to assess the quality of youth leaders that we are producing? Because if you take the past 10 years and you look at key institutions, like your political parties, like your organizations, the quality of youth leaders that we have produced over the couple of years, aside from me, of course, <laughs> and my colleagues sitting there, has really declined, right? So we can't speak about the future of South Africa without speaking about where we are in terms of the youth leadership so that we can start tackling this very issue of sustainability that we have in South African uh, leadership. So, um, yeah, what are the metrics that we can uh, use to 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 cut that? Thank you very much. We've noted the question. My assistant, you had a question, and then, yes. Do you take any tasks? Uh, Why? Hope to be let in those online. We have the, okay. Can you please let in those who are online, and we'll take a question online as well. Uh, my sister, your question, and then we'll come to the panels. Yeah. Um, we are all super proud of the jobs that are being created in the VPO sector. And so I feel that I think that give you an opportunity to have someone from the department that will boast about it. The jobs are being created. My question is where are those people committed to and where are they committed from? So, when we talk about economic um, inclusivity, I think sometimes within the waste that we're the most divided province at this point in time. And we have all those thousands of jobs that are created. We've got thousands of people sitting on buses and taxis coming into the city center. So from West Coast to Finland, when do we get to the stage that we actually invest 
yeah. closer to where those people are staying so that they don't spend half their salaries on all these jobs that we say we get in. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start with the first question about the metrics on uh, youth leadership development. We'll start with Professor Madonsela and have you on that question, and then we'll come to the other panelists. Oh, great. Thank you, Shay, and thank you to colleagues for the excellent and insightful questions. Regarding the need to train employees of government in leadership and proper governance, that's a valid thing, and it is being done. What I do know, because I do training, is that from a neuroscience science point of view, uh, once of training doesn't work. So it, you need to train and then reinforce monthly. I'm, I'm, I'm taking my team tomorrow, we'll start playing and we'll reinforce things. So we do that all the time. The National School of Government is very particular about training civil servants to serve the nation, not to serve any political government, I mean, any political party or any individual person. And, and they bring leaders from Oxford, China, Singapore, and, and different schools of, of public leadership. And you will know that China is one of the best when it comes to training public servants that are oriented in servant leadership, but um, but the best as far as I know is Singapore in, in terms of training people rightly, and they, they've done that. However, that said, I, I think it has to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. What I did pick though from the inquirer is also what happens to some of those who might lose jobs? And is there a plan for them, for what happens to people, people who are flying away? That's something we have to think of because a child who does not feel the warmth of a village bends the village down. And a lot of our people who, are, for example, have voted a particular anti-constitutional party, we're benefiting from some of the patronage networks. And when you cut off those patronage networks in a country where there aren't enough opportunities for legitimate livelihoods. So why don't you then make a plan to make sure that all villages, all townships, all neighborhoods are, you know, at Tuma we speak about the need when people give a state of the nation address, we don't want you to talk about averages. Tell us what is happening in all worlds. Tell us about your initiatives in all of the world. And I like to, um, my colleague from Good Governance Africa, where you're saying you want to work with governments, with local government, because that's where really change should happen. And, and it, but it's not just officials that are committed to a party political line. I once asked a certain mayor why people in four wards were not moving forward. That mayor, he or she, said to me, they voted for the other party and there's nothing we can do for them. So that's not knowing the law, because if you're the president, you're the president of, of the whole country. And if you're a mayor, you're a mayor of the whole country. It doesn't matter who voted for who. And in any event, ward councillors are not administrators. They don't have resources to do anything. The resources that are given to a municipality are to serve the interests of all the people and to level the playing field. A rising, a rising tide does not lift everyone. Joseph Stiglitz tells us that, Amartya Sen tells us that. A rising tide throws people off board if they are not anchored. So what we need is to make sure that we build capabilities, we remove barriers to make sure that honestly, everyone rises. But in a country where other people have been held back or thrown off board, deliberately bring them back on board. And that should be taught to civil servants. I must say to the extent he can do it, despite his party, the premier of the Western Cape does try his best. Lastly, uh, how do you assess the quality of leaders? And that's an important thing. And, and this is where maybe business schools should go to government and work with the National School of Government and say, we suggest these factors. At, at Tuma, we suggest that it's important that 
we test a leader in terms of what are their ethics. And the ethics are the, in the Constitution. The, at least the key values are in the Constitution. Equality or the achievement of equality, freedom, um, and a constitutional supremacy and Ubuntu-based values. And then you then also have the principles of public administration in Section 195 of the Constitution. So before anybody is promoted to leadership at the highest level, I, I saw recently when somebody who had, I, I think, five degrees, master's degrees, was important. They said, oh, we've never seen somebody who's so super qualified. I said, this is one of the reasons government is failing, is that they assume that if you have multiple degrees and if you have a doctorate, you qualify to lead. No, um, it's, a, it's a good thing that our, our young people are studying, but leadership is developed in the field, guys. You can't move straight from multiple degrees to lead an organization. and. Lastly, ours is ethical, purpose-driven, impact-conscious, and committed serve, and with four intelligences, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, spiritual intelligence, and normal intelligence. Maybe spiritual, we can, we can ignore it, but certainly the first three are important. That's what we say at Juma and at Southern Bush University at the Frederick van Sales Labert Institute they do like um, grounding young people in the epic leadership model. And of course, social justice is one of those values that whether we like it or not, we must work to advance it. And there are no institutions that are funded by the state that are excluded from redressing apartheid and patriarchal imbalances. And this is one of the things we need to, to teach about. And I want to to disagree a little bit with my colleague Kulati about, no, it's not you say, it's, it's, it's the inquirer, one of the colleagues of inquirer. We do have a vision in this country, it's in the constitution, and at Stellenbosch University, that vision is worked very well. And the vice chancellor reinforces and reinforces it every time when the young people come. At the law school, we give them the constitution and we get them to read the preamble. And at the front of the law school, which is an old building, they put the preamble because they want people to know what kind of country are we building. Just read that preamble and know we're building a country that is founded on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, where every citizen's life is improved and every person's potential in fleet. And that goes down to Amasha Sen's capabilities, social justice theory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, unfortunately, I can't take more questions uh, because of time so that we can come back again here tomorrow. Um, so, Bob uh, Kulati, your response um, to the questions uh, as brief as you can, and uh, Ms. Thunder as well, the direct question that came to you. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. I just wanted to respond to the issue of the public service servants. Uh, uh, Professor Sumatra Dafikeni is now the head of uh, Public Service Commission, and they are working very, very hard to create, to, uh, to insulate uh, the administration from the political interference so that uh, people that are professionals, uh, you know, who are public servants can do their work. Because now, as things stand now, there's a lot of interference, a lot of instructions, a lot of stuff that's coming through. So they are bringing together a bill uh, into the, you know, so I think organizations like ours, we definitely, because we are working on MOE with them, we're going to comment on that bill. We're going to be participating in this because it's an important piece of work, even for organizations like B B BMF, we need to, to do that. Uh, just on the other question uh, about the metric, Metris, metrics, metrics, I don't know what the word is. <laughs> yeah, but I think uh, it's a very important question. Um, on behalf of uh, Good Governance Africa, we, we are implementing now a new program. We call it YEG, which is Young Advocates for Good Governance. The idea is to recruit, train, empower a million young 
uh, advocates for good governance that are going to go through a curriculum which is going to include the seven points I talked about, but also other issues like social justice, ethical leadership, and all the issues that you are talking about. Because the issue here is that you do not want, uh, you know, the, the whole idea came from the fact that uh, we wanted to move away from just what we call civic or voter education. We wanted people to embrace a way, a, a, a mindset of being advocates for good governance, wherever they are in the world, whether they are in business or in uh, wherever they are. So we are rolling that out now. We're calling on partners for people that can help us to develop this curriculum and uh, to train and recruit these young people. We want to make sure that those young doctors who do not have employment, once they become part of this group, then we can link them to organizations and other places that can take them in we also want to say to the business world, let's not wait for people to be experienced before we employ them. Where are they going to get the experience? We need to take them and employ them and put them to, to good use. I just have one question, uh, uh, challenge as I conclude for black uh, uh, leaders and professionals, especially in the corporate world. And I think the members of uh, BMF uh, fall in that, some of them at least. You know, I once worked for an organization uh, which was a, a, a social development program for the petroleum industry. I'll just be quick on this one. It was called the Paraffin Safety Association of Southern Africa. You know, paraffin is a product that is being used for thermal applications like cooking, heating, and, and lighting. At the time, it was used by 21 million people in South Africa, even those people that had, were receiving free basic electricity. So by the time you get to the 15th of the month, the electricity is gone, even if they had the money. So they fall back to unsafe uh, you know, energy sources like coal, candle, paraffin, all of those kinds of stuff. We all know that. So then what happened was that when you started to see the, the, the petroleum industry transforming, especially in the positions of, uh, of uh, social, what do you call that, uh, social investment, in those kinds of positions were being taken by, uh, by black leaders and all of that kind of stuff. So I got to hear from two of them that says, hey man, when you come in here, the bosses tell you to, to, to cut budgets. As soon as the instruction comes to cut budgets, they go straight to cut the projects that go and, and develop people in the communities. Instead of implementing efficiency measures, you know, some of these people grew up in the, with, these, uh, with these stoves and, and other problems that I'm talking about. So as soon as the instruction comes, they would then go there. Instead of improving efficiency in terms of travel, you know, phones, whatever the case may be, they go for the easy to cut. And then the other, the, so, so, so what I'm trying to say is that we must not forget where we come from, even when we're in corporates, when we are in these places, because ultimately the reason for these corporates is for the benefit of communities. And for me, I feel like, and I'm not saying, I'm not blaming everyone, but I'm just giving a challenge to say when people are in these positions of power, let's use that power to develop and grow programs that are supposed to help people rather than using budgetary uh, diversions to, to kill those kinds of things. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Me, sorry, can I yes. have one sentence to a question she's about to answer? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> you, you, you are interjecting our process. <laughs> it's it's going to be very... <laughs> Five seconds. Five seconds. I just looked from the Western Cape Westbrook right to she asked a question around employment. Unfortunately or unfortunately, I'm a bit close to that space. My biggest one is ownership. A lot of these BPOs that I think are being bragged about, yes. while they're predominantly white owned, I actually know of some that are actually migrating from Joburg no. that are coming to set up shop here no. who are white owned. No. And what is being done to transform that space? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of them are UK invested businesses. Yeah. 
uh, like while our people are getting employed, none of these, at least I don't know of any one of them, who's black owned. Um, what is being done to deliberately no. increase ownership in the BPO space? The West Africa. That's just mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I'm answering questions on behalf of the DA. Um, <laughs> I need to say that I'm not yes. the DA. But what I would like to do before I answer the questions, I would like to talk a little bit about the work that Westgro does. So I think that Westgro is the official trade, investment, and tourism promotion agency for Cape Town and the Western Cape. And we've got four areas that we look at. The first is is that we differentiate the Western Cape, Cape Town and the Western Cape in the international market. So we play in the consideration space. So we make sure that if a tourist, an investor, or a buyer, a global buyer, wants to um, go to a destination, that they choose Cape Town and the Western Cape. So we're really, really active internationally to make sure that our Cape Town and Western Cape brand is strong. So that's the first thing that we do. And in order to do that, um, we we do a number of things. So the first initiative that we've got is, is that we have something called Cape Town Air Access, it's a public-private partnership, where we try and attract direct services um, air services from around the world to the Western Cape. So you probably would have heard that we had last year alone, we brought in 13 direct flights from uh, the United States. And we connected New York, Washington and uh, Atlanta directly with Cape Town. And that of course brought with it lots and lots of tourists and created lots and lots of jobs. Um, the the second important thing that we do is is that we um, run something called Cruise Cape Town. So we attract cruise ships. I think you would have seen all of the cruise ships in the harbour. That brings in really high end visitors, which means that again we are creating jobs. And um, I hope that you know I, I know that creating jobs is not enough, but that is what we do. That's our mandate. Um, and then with the Convention Bureau, we also make sure that we attract events into the Western Cape and we attract international events into the Western Cape. For every event that we attract, for every person that we bring into the into the Western Cape, there's obviously an economic impact and, and, and that is, is useful. So those are some of the things that we do. We're also working, um, and those are all public-private partnerships, so we get the private sector to invest in, in some of those initiatives. More recently, We've been working with the Western Cape Department of Education, um, and the the intention there is to attract um, private sector investment into school bills. So it's quite an innovative um, uh, intervention, but the idea is is that the private sector needs to pay forward, and that they need to also invest in the in the education and training um, uh, in the in, in 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 the space. The second big thing that we do is is that we go out there and we meet with international investors to try and attract investors into the Western Cape. We had a number of key initiatives. So we look at what's happening in the economy and we try and connect what's happening, what the economy requires. So for example, with load shedding, a big thing was to um, attract uh, companies into the energy space so we've got a lot of renewable energy companies there's a lot you know so this is the kind of work that we do um investment into water that that sort of thing um uh we also have diversified so a big thing that we're doing now is we diversified we've got three key markets where we attract investment from it's the usa um, north america uh, USA, um, Europe, and 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 the UK, um, and we're diversifying that now. We were looking at Africa, the Middle East, and China, and we're making really, really, really good progress um, in that regard. And the idea is, is to bring investment from new sources into into the Western Cape. The third thing that we do is we take Western Cape goods and services, and we make sure that they hit the international marketplace. And we do that through a number of things. We obviously um, market under the banner of Made in the Cape, so it's Cape Town and the Western Cape. Um, and then, of course, we also train um, emerging, uh, not emerging, but exporters that are ready for the market. We train them and we take them on mission. So for example, we will take, if they're black wine producers, we will take black wine producers into market and we will connect those wine producers with the international buyers so that they can sell their, so that they can sell their wines. Um, and we run a, we also run a, uh, um, a digital platform where we connect 
uh, local buyers and local sellers. Um, with respect, and then of course the fourth one, very importantly, is tourism. So we do a lot of work in the tourism space where we go around and we work with, um, uh, uh, we go to all the trade shows around the world and we make sure that everybody around the world knows about Cape Town and the Western Cape. Um, we, in the last financial year, we had 93 um, international missions um, and we also hosted 63 international delegations in the Western Cape, um, touching on 47 countries. So I feel a little bit like we carry the Western Cape flag and we put it onto Mount Everest, we go wherever we need to. And that is the, the, the contribution that obviously, that's our role, is to is, is the rising tide. I think that they obviously, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's about all of us working together. There are other people that might have to pick up the people that fall into the river. That is, you know, that is, you know, so so we all have to do our different parts. Ours is to rise the tide. Um, and then I think just to maybe answer the question, I agree with you that, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I just had a look through my notes, but um, certainly the city of Cape Town um, has, and, and I do want to say, you know, it's not, it's not bragging, but it is, there's an important thing that is happening in Cape Town and the Western Cape, and that is that there's a shift from uh, consumptive spending to infrastructure spending. So we're seeing the province and the city investing in infrastructure, and they're investing in, um, you know, the the it, it was Ned Bank that did a piece of research of the hundred billion uh, government projects that was announced. Sixty percent are in the Western Cape, um, and it is in the following areas. One of it to respond to your question is that um, the My City Bus rapid transport system is being expanded to Kalicha and Mitchell's Plain, and so should by 2026 there should be My City Bus. It should have happened a long time ago. Um, but but I'm not the DA and I'm not the city of Cape Town. So that is the role. The next time you must invite the mayor. Um, but I'm not the mayor. My job is to make sure that we position Cape Town and the Western Cape so that we grow this economy. And I think, um, you know, so, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, my day. Thank you very much. I don't think we'll, we'll ever have enough time for all these engagements. Um, there's just another important people who are online. It's the British Chamber members. Um, there's also them online, so acknowledge their presence as well. And there's a growing relationship between BMF, Henley, and now with also the British Chamber as well. So we welcome them as well as we close. And um, I'm being told as well by my team that as you exit there's a qr code that you can scan as a survey uh, can you please take it so that uh, you can give us feedback on the session i think uh, already we've started to talk about a part two so this is not the end i uh, remember henley has got a campus here and in joburg so we'll probably do a part two in joburg maybe a part three in cape town again but uh, that is also on the cards and uh wait I think that's the last thing they asked me to to announce. And uh, as we as we draw to a close, I'll call upon uh, the Western Cape chairperson uh, of BMF to give us a vote of thanks as we wrap up the show. Yeah. Please give a round of, a round of applause. I have a very soft voice, so I'll try to be as loud as I can. You can all hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm very, I'm very soft-spoken, so I'll try to be loud, as loud as I can. Uh, I hope that the people online can hear me. Uh, as it's been said, my name is Kanyong Gwenya. I'm the chair of the BMF in the Western Cape. I would first like to just uh, thank our partners. Um, firstly, uh, Henley Business School, who has uh, been, uh, you know, co-hosting this event with us. Uh, thank them and also thank uh, the British Chamber of uh, Commerce that is joining us online. I'd like to also thank the speakers that are here with us uh, this evening. But really, I just want to also just um, 
highlight some few uh, sort of nuggets that I think we can take away with us from the discussion this evening. Um, from advocate Smart Donsela, um, she spoke about um, that business, um, you know, sort of emphasizing on the partnership between business and government and how it is important that uh, business needs to work together with government. She also emphasized on the fact that, you know, if um, business and government work together in terms of the scenario planning it would have been uh, predicted the outcome of the coalition uh, from uh, Ronell, i'd like to uh, check away the points around uh, where she spoke about you know about accountability of leadership she says that um you know leadership um we need to hold leadership accountable and we need to grow a culture uh, that we hold our government accountable at all time because ultimately we voted for this government so we need to hold them accountable and then from uh, uh patrick uh, he spoke uh, obviously gave that analogy of a buffalo and uh, and the lion i think we'll all remember that part where he he, he sort of made a comparison uh, i guess the buffalo being uh, south africa our country and how how um you know our country was um under attack for for a number of years and we've almost uh, you know went under but we were able to survive because of the championship and uh, and and the voice of the you know the chaps and institutions that were busy championing that hey what is going on here so i think just something that we can learn from that is that we need to sort of open our voices and be out there and don't uh, lose um our position so um i think just to 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 um wrap it up i'm just going to touch just a little bit about um uh, about the BMF to say that you know what are we looking at, or rather what are we looking to 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 this uh, incoming government? I think for us as the BMF, we are calling for leadership that is sober-minded, that will put the interests of the country before the, each political party's ideology, the leadership that will uh, uphold the true rule of law and the constitution, leadership that will come with action, leadership that, that will liberate our country, leadership that stands uh, that understands that ethical leadership starts with good governance, leadership that will act with a sense of urgency to turn our country around and appoint competent leaders in uh, key strategic roles. Uh, the BMF has contributed immensely in driving transformation agenda in South Africa. We have been at the forefront uh, advocating for the transformation laws of South Africa. Uh, we all know that uh, for effective change to start, uh, we need the right leadership. So for the past 48 years in the BMF, we have contributed to the assignments of developing leaders Leaders. Um, and over the over the years, we have developed over 100 leaders uh, who have gone on to be powerhouses of corporates in South Africa. So that is just the journey of the organisation that we have been in in South Africa. We've also had a long history of working with governments and corporates in, in the way that we've run uh, sort of uh, programs uh, that drive socioeconomic transformation. So as the BMF, we remain hopeful that the transformation agenda will continue regardless of the of the parties that come into the coalition government. Uh, we hope that you know transformation, inclusive economic growth, addressing inequality and uh, accelerating uh, socioeconomic transformation should be at the top agenda uh, of these coalition negotiations. Uh, the BMF uh, is the midwife uh, that gave birth to the BE Act, and we are the custodians of the transformation laws of this country. So we remain open to supporting the incoming government uh, in ensuring that the transformation agenda continues uh, and that it is, it is felt in all corners of this country. We also want to ensure that, you know, when it's being felt in this all, all, all corners of the country, that the people that are marginalized who are living in poverty, their lives get to change. And we want to see them, you know, the, the, the living, you know, the improved living conditions and, uh, you know, that they improve, you know, um, the, the income. Uh, so on behalf of the BMF, I'd like to also just thank uh, uh, Henley, our strategic partner, who has been uh, so gracious in allowing us into this beautiful space of ours, of theirs. And um, we've also been co-hosting this event with us. I'd like to also thank uh, the members of the British Chamber of uh, Business Commerce, who I believe have also joined us online, uh, to thank them for their presence. But also special thanks goes to our three speakers, uh, Patrick, Sistuli, and uh, Ronald, for just gracing us with your presence this evening, also the thoughts that you have shared uh, in this discussion. Uh, with that being said, I also just to thank all of you members who are here in this room. Uh, you're just really, really overwhelmed.
and wellness as the BMF leadership just by this positive uh, sort of turnout that you've, you've, you've had. And we understand that it's cold in Cape Town, but we really, really appreciate it. And we hope this is not the last time that we get to see you and we get to engage you. So thank you so much and uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thanks again, uh, colleagues, for staying uh, this evening. And of course, this is not, it's not the end. We want to do more engagements, but most importantly, all the challenges we've taken note of. And of course, as we hold government accountable, we as BMF and Henley must also be held accountable for what we agreed to do together. So that is the commitment that we must jointly make and continue to raise the power of leadership and ideas in the country. As a token of appreciation, um, I'd ask um, our acting president to just to join me quickly to hand over the token of appreciation to our speakers. I'm specifically giving you Ms. Standers first because there's there's books there, so there's a special message. There's two books in there, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Kulate, thank you very much, Baba. Thank you. Thank you. This is a surprise for you oh. from Andy. Oh, okay. For Kudu. Uh, talking about appreciation, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For a picture, what happens? <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much. And thank you to Prof. Matt Donzella. We will send your, your token of appreciation. Uh, maybe maybe at the next event, uh, Prof, uh, we'll give it to you there. Yeah, but, but thank you very much. We'll definitely send it to you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dinner is also served. So please network and engage and continue to raise the power of leadership. Thank you very much.